Aloha, and welcome to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We air live every Thursday at 2 o'clock uh, from 2 to 2.30, uh, and we are a, a program that talks about positive stories in Hawaii, success stories that we uh, have experience here in Hawaii. Uh, we broadcast live from downtown Honolulu in the Pioneer Plaza in the studios of Think Tech Hawaii in beautiful downtown Honolulu. I like Honolulu. So we, um, we're going to be talking to a, a successful attorney in town who just opened his practice and he's spending a lot of time uh, working with small and, and mid-sized businesses uh, as well as other clients. But I wanted to mention just one uh, article that I saw that came up again. It's been in the news uh, repeatedly, uh, and it was actually the trigger of why I wanted to start this show uh, about a year ago. Uh, CNBC came out with another one of their surveys, uh, and they do this every year, uh, and Hawaii is ranked 49th out of 50 for places to do business in the country. Uh, and that may be the case. I'm not going to argue with the rankings. Uh, we've had that ranking now for a while, so this is nothing new. It's the same old, same old. Uh, but I do want to just mention that there are reasons that we want to have businesses in Hawaii. I don't think we need to take this 49th ranking and use it as a reason to not try. We do have success in Hawaii. We've got a lot of successful uh, business people and uh, companies in Hawaii that are doing quite well. Uh, and I, I think that if we just take a look at, at what the PBN does every year with the fastest 50, we take a look at what the SBA does with their awards every year, and, and Hawaii Business and the Chamber of Commerces, they all recognize successful businesses. Uh, we do have a lot of good stories to tell. So uh, I think that we just need to get away from the rhetoric a little bit and look at the positive instead of dwelling on the negative. Now, one of those positives uh, today uh, is going to be an attorney uh, that I've got some experience with um, and we are going to talk a little bit about him personally uh, and how he's gotten into the practice and then we're going to spend a, a little bit of the, the show talking about LLCs and how you have to be careful. They're very popular, a lot of businesses have them, they use them, but they, have, they can be a little tricky. So, Jeff, welcome to the show. It's Thank good you. to have you here. Thanks, Red. All right. Now, tell us a, a little bit about yourself. Uh, what's the name of your firm, and, and you know, what, what type of clients do you have? Uh, it's just me. I'm, I'm the law office of Jefferson S. Willard, Esquire. Uh, and uh, a lot of my litigation, mainly litigation, I don't do any transactional. Uh, some trial work, I still have some. I was a prosecutor here in the city. Uh, several years back and then uh, so I still do some criminal defense but a lot of my stuff I'm transitioning towards a lot more business uh, clients um, so <clears throat> and in business the litigation often comes up like you said with LLC's and when they're shutting down when uh, when they're not done right but right now you've been in Hawaii for a while though right been in Hawaii for close to 20 years yeah. I came here in the Navy uh, and you had an interesting career in the Navy too. You got to travel quite a bit. Yeah, I traveled a lot. I was um, uh, went in the Navy as a, I was an in intelligence. I was a cryptologist, crypto linguist. Um, uh, the Navy taught me Vietnamese, sent me to school for Vietnamese, uh, taught me Japanese. I, I went to Monterey, um, the Presidio in Monterey, mm. that was called the Defense Language Institute for Vietnamese. Um, <clears throat> and then they um, sent me to. Vietnam to search for missing Americans. Interesting. What years were you in Vietnam? Uh, got to got there in '95. I got to got to Hawaii at the uh, Joint Task Force uh, searching for missing Americans. Back then, it was called Joint Task Force mm -hmm. Full Accounting. And '95, and uh, was here till down in there till '99. I guess. That must have been tough duty. I uh, I, I was in uh, Vietnam in in '74 and '75. Uh, and I was there for the evacuation of Saigon. And I know, I guess, uh, finding some of the remains is, is some of the folks that maybe we left behind and we have to go back and, and bring them home. I think when we first started, that was the, that was the impetus. Uh, you know, when, the, when Congress first set up the Joint Task Force was, uh, uh, you know, when you care enough to send the very best is what they said. You know, they, they, would, they would have, uh, they had a Joint Task Force of, of all, you know, hand-picked is what, they, what we said. Um, <clears throat> but now JPAC, uh, which uh, is down on Hickam, 
uh, it goes pretty much all over the world searching for American military mm. remains. Um, and you know, Congress has found fit to, that that this is one of the prime, one of the reasons, one of the primary. Uh, it's important enough to send well, it's, good it's men. It's critically important. I mean, nobody wants to go to war if there's no chance of them coming back. So there's there's got to always be that hope that you're going to come home again, one way or another. You know, I, so I can yeah. certainly appreciate that. Um, but after you were in the, the Navy for a while, then you um, got out and, what, you went right into the prosecutor's office? Or? Uh, I was, yeah, I got out, uh, went, used the GI Bill to go to college here at UH Manoa. Well, started at KCC, then went to UH Manoa. Um, and then after, you know, UH undergrad, I went directly into UH Law School. Very good. Uh, you know, because, the, because I had the GI Bill, I didn't have to work. Uh, and so I was able to make good grades, and so I was able to get into a good graduate degree program. And Excellent. I think that's one of those things that's probably underestimated about the GI Bill is how, how much it helps you in your graduate, getting into a graduate degree. Well, program. I wouldn't be where I am today without the GI Bill. And, and although I took a different track, I started at HCC and then <laughs> went to Manoa. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, we've got some similarities, and, and the GI Bill makes a world of difference, too. Yeah. So it, it yeah. helped out a lot. And so you graduated from the, the, the law school here, and then... Uh, went into prosecuting office then? I, or? Actually, I went, uh, me and my wife, uh, uh, I, I convinced my wife that we should go to Vietnam and work for a Vietnamese law firm. Uh, wow, that must have taken a lot of convincing. It, it, did, it <laughs> did, it did, it did. And then as soon as I got, we were over there a couple, uh, about six months, and she convinced me that we should <laughs> we should come back. It's, it's tough. I guess having that international law experience is kind of interesting because they tend to do things a little bit differently, maybe? They do. They do. Um, I remember, I think I was, yeah, there was, there's, I, I, sometimes I say the law is kind of a cultural practice. Um, it's, it's, you know, they, as far as a rule of law um, in, in courtrooms in Vietnam, I, the example that stands out the most is uh, uh, we had a maritime dispute where the Vietnamese judge said, you know, Mr. Willard, if we were in America, you would have won, but we're not. I guess, uh, you know, different laws and different borders, you know, it tends to, to shift around a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, well, that's yeah. interesting. Um, yeah, and so then your wife, or I guess you both decided to come back to Hawaii? Yeah, we came back, uh, we came back to Hawaii, uh, and uh, then, you know, I, 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 had, I had met um, uh, Doug Chen and Peter Carlisle, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, while I was at the prosecutor, while I was in law school, and then uh, as, when I came back, uh, you know, I I put in my application at the prosecutor's office under mm -hmm. uh, under Peter, and uh, the day I got off the plane from Vietnam, I got a call from Doug. Oh, great! Yeah, uh, uh, so timing was good then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, and how long were you there? At the prosecutor, yes. uh, it was about four years, I think, yeah, something like that. It was uh, for the ending of uh, Peter's. Um, uh, time there and then for about a year and a half under Keith, uh, yeah. Keith Kaneshiro. So you know a lot of the court systems here and the local ways of, of how things work yeah. and and now you're out on your own. Yep, uh, we, um, I, me and some friends from the prosecutor started our own law firm uh, and it was, you know, it was really uh, a great experience and then uh, as I started transitioning more into civil um, you know, I, I wanted to spend less time in courtrooms mm -hmm. and more time in the office doing, you know, doing And work. so the original group that you started with tended to go more on the criminal side? Yeah, 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 we did, because that was, that was what we... You that's know, your comfort zone. That was our comfort zone, yeah. right, right. All right, so now then you went into the, the civil, and now you're also starting to expand into the business side. Right, so more in the business side now, getting, um, uh, have a, seen a lot of clients, and I'm not sure if it's, um, you know, I haven't been doing it long enough to know if it's a trend, but um, a lot of these LLCs, when they uh, begin to wind down, there's a lot of problems. I mean, I mean the, probably the biggest is lack of operating agreements, mm. but, but that tends to cause many other problems. Well, they are very popular. I mean, I know a, a lot of, and I specialize in that small and mid-sized business uh, market display, uh, space, and I know that uh, predominantly, at least in the last 10, 15 years, the majority of the companies that are getting set up are done under that LLC uh, umbrella. It's, there, you, you, you sh I think m most people would need a, a particular reason not to file a, an LLC, you know, if they wanted to have separate types of stock, then they would go uh, C corporation, or if they, um, you know, but I think if, if you don't have any idea what kind of business, if you don't have any reason not to do an LLC, you probably should do an LLC. 
And what are, I guess the LLC itself is a fairly simple process to set up? It's uh, very simple. You can, uh, a lot of people do it themselves online. Um, basically just, um, you know, you, you go to the, um, the DCCA website um, and then, uh, you know, which I think it's the state of Hawaii. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the website is, but uh, you just file and then uh, you don't need article, or you do, uh, file the articles in corporation. You get your, during the process, you can also uh, get a uh, federal EIN. Um, you know, you need to get your GET. That's a, kind of a separate process, right. that would be the one. But. And they have the Business Action Center right down on Nimitz that can also right. help you with that process. And, and they can, uh, you know, help you with the GET application and, and get whatever business license you need. And uh, they, they can walk you through some of that. Um, and I think they even can help explain how to get the, the EFIN if you need it. All right. But if you've got, if it's a single member, do you still not need a federal ID, or can you use your social security number for that? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't, I guess you, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I know when I do tax yeah. returns for the single member LLC, we don't even use the EFIN. We just use the uh, social security number of the single member, yeah. and it's a, an ignored entity. And so it, it makes this tax return process a lot easier. But once they have two members, then you can't do that anymore. Uh, and then you have to file a separate tax return. Then you need to have that even. Yeah. You know, so it gets a little bit more tricky. I think, well, and of this, even the sole member, the single, you know, single, single member, member managed LLCs that I've set up, I've always gotten even. Got them. Yeah, yeah. I always get even. It's probably best to have it and not need it. And I think the banks appreciate it. Yeah. I would imagine <laughs> you know, the more the banks can get, the more they're happy. <laughs> the more happy my bank is, the more happy that's, I am. That's a, as long as they keep writing those or clearing the checks and writing the loans. Yeah. Uh, very good. So other than uh, working with the, the small businesses on the LLCs, do you do any any other types of services your firm uh, offers? Yeah, that uh, along with the LLCs comes a lot of tax stuff um, and some tax, uh, tax appeals, uh, mm -hmm. some dealing with the, as a litigator um, doing tax appeals, what I've found is that um, approaching a, 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 a appeal to the tax court um, you know and doing appropriate discovery and investigation depositions um, it's very effective and uh, and I'm and I believe it you know I, so far for me it's been very effective when it gets tricky these days with um, going with full discovery because there's so many different things that have to be included in that discovery process well, right? and also mm -hmm. when you start requesting discovery from the state they start requesting discovery from your client and then if your client doesn't have it or if he's yeah it's, it it is it, 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 it have to have the right client and it has to be a litigation stance uh, case from the beginning yeah. right so in some of the, the tax appeal work that you do, I guess uh, what triggers that or what triggers people to come to you is, is if they get a letter from either the IRS or Department of Taxation challenging a position or saying they owe additional taxes, or maybe they are even looking back several years um, and then trying to you know, collect more than either right. you know, what was originally reported or whatever those circumstances are. When they get these letters, that's when the client needs to come to you and, and say, hey, what do I do? Oh, yeah, yes, absolutely. They need, uh, as soon as they get that letter, hopefully they already have a CPA um, and they contact their CPA and their CPA would, um, you know, if their CPA feels, feels it's necessary to get a lawyer involved, their CPA would contact a lawyer. Um, because if you get, a, um, if you get a, a final assessment, you only have 30 days. To appeal. Got to be quick. Right. Yeah. And it's, uh, unless you really know what you're doing, it's probably not a good idea to get on the phone or start shooting off emails or letters or something oh, because no. it, it, they can make the situation a little bit worse if you're not handling it properly. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Well, you know, we're going to take a, a short break, uh, but when we come back, I want to spend a little bit more time on the LLCs and, and how we set it up, what the different requirements are. And then I guess some of the, the challenges that you have found in shutting them down, because yeah. there's some risks there, and, and that was the, kind of the nature of the show today is to talk about those risks. Uh, but this is Reg Baker, Business in Hawaii. Uh, we're going to take a short break. We're, we're talking with Jeff Willard today on the, uh, the, some of the risky elements of an LLC, particularly when we shut down. So we'll be right back. Hi, my name is Kim Lau, and I'm the host of Hawaii Rising. You can watch me every other Monday at 4 p.m. Aloha. My name is John Waihe, and I actually had a small part to do with what's happening today. Served actually in public office. 
But if you don't already know that, here's a chance to learn more about what's happening in our state by joining me for Talk Story with John Waihe every other Monday. Thank you, and I look forward to your seeing us in the future. Aloha everyone, I'm Maria Mera and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show Viva Hawaii on ThinTech Hawaii every other Monday at 3 p.m. We are here to talk about news, issues and events local and around the world. Join me. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Uh, we're talking today with Jeff Willard, who's a, an attorney. He's been in practice for a, a while now, uh, and he uh, comes from the prosecutor's office, but he's focusing a little bit more on the civil and the business side of things. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about LLCs, and I guess we know how popular they are, but we have to make sure that they're done right, particularly when we start shutting them down. So I guess, uh, I don't know if there's any statistics on this, Jeff, but I know that a, a majority of uh, small businesses that have started in the last 10 years have leaned towards the LLC side, uh, which means they're pretty popular. Um, but they're easy to set up is one reason. They don't cost a lot. Uh, they're easy to maintain. I think you have to just do one annual report, but it's still an entity. It's still something that has to be respected and treated and not commingled with other assets. So, you know, um, how necessary is it to have, you know, regular meetings and minutes and that so sort of thing for an LLC? Is it as important in that environment as it is for, say, a partnership or a C Corp? Uh, the meetings and the minutes um, are not as important. Have I found, um, say for instance, like a 501c3, uh, the meetings and minutes are the, the that, that's the heart of the organization. That's what's going to keep you, your status, right? Um, but uh, for an LLC, it's, it's yeah, it's very easy to set up and it's it's easy to maintain. It's 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 a it's a you know um, disregarded entity mm -hmm. and it provides a, a, an amount of depending on how you how you d choose to structure it. it provides an amount of uh, liability protection. Right. And in order to increase the strength of that limited liability, it's, it's best to treat it, although it's ignored for tax purposes, it still is a legal entity. And so they need to have their own checking account and you don't want to commingle funds and you want to keep everything as clean and distinct as possible. Right. Exactly. When they first, when we, when our, our, our legislature, I think in 96, when they put together the uh, RLLC statute, um, it uh, said that you know failure to ad failure to adhere to the you know the um, the, the basic uh, uh, principles or, or you know um, accounting things like that was not a reason to pierce the corporate veil, mm -hmm. not a reason to get past liability. Um, but uh, in I think 2006 there was an amendment um, that uh, to the 420 HRS 428 um, and 428 I think dash two. Uh, that says, you know, that you, the, the LLC must follow the corporate um, structure and must, you know, have meetings and minutes. And, okay. But at the same time, there's no, there's no case in Hawaii so far where an LLC has, where somebody has pierced the corporate veil in an LLC for failing to uh, adhere to the corporate structure for, not that I know of. Right. Well, but nonetheless, I mean, even though it may not be specifically required, um, or maybe it hasn't been challenged yet, it never hurts to have that. It just provides a little extra protection. Well, and also it, when, it's going to come down to your Schedule C. If you're ignoring the corporate uh, structure, mm -hmm. if you're, mm -hmm. you're co-mingling or if you're not keeping track of the co company, uh, then when you're doing your Schedule C, on, you're, you're going to have problems with your account. Yeah, when well, the accounting gets a little messed up. So. <laughs> Now, so we've got this LLC, it's been operating, maybe a, a business owner set it up themselves. Um, now, is there articles of incorporation or what, what are the, so the, the art, operating agreement, you know, what, how necessary is that? Well, the articles of incorporation are uh, absolutely necessary. It's not, a, it's not a corporation without it. Um, the, for an LLC, the um, operating agreement, I mean, there's no requirement for an operating agreement. Uh, but if you don't have an operating agreement and you have a multi-member LLC, um, well, you, actually, you do have an operating. If you don't have an operating agreement, then the default operating agreement is the HRS 428, mm -hmm. and it has some very strict provisions. Uh, for instance, uh, that all members must take equal shares. Um, it requires, and 
the LLC statute itself requires that um, you can't give yourself a distribution from your LLC that will prevent you from being able to pay your debts. That's, okay. that's always, but. So even if you don't have a written one that you created yourself, by default, you have one through HRS 428. Yes. Yeah. HRS is Hawaii Revised Statute. Right. right. All right. So, and that may not be what you want. You might not want to give, there might be different uh, contributions by different members that, um, you know, some members are, are more active, less active, and you might not want to give equal distributions so, all the time. hypothetically, if I had an LLC single member and I don't have an operating agreement and therefore the default is, is 428, if I wanted to bring in a minority shareholder or member that has maybe 10%, I got 90 because I, want, I need some help and I want to reward them, that really doesn't matter because I don't have an operating agreement. 428 says we have to be equal. Right. You would have to you would have to create an operating agreement, and then that might become part of the negotiation for hiring your your new partner. All right. So if there's any company that's out there that does not have an operating agreement and has an LLC with more than one member, they better get in touch with you, <laughs> and, and we got to figure yeah. this out and get it fixed. Yeah, it'd be, it's better. Uh, the disassociation. Uh, when when they start breaking down and uh, if there's no operating agreement, disassociation can become very litigious and I sometimes refer to it as a divorce court of the business world. All right, well let's let's talk about that for a minute because nobody sets up an LLC with the intent of shutting it down anytime soon. But if you've had an LLC for a while and you've been trying this business, as a matter of fact, I would imagine that there are people out there that have multiple LLCs and they have different. I mean, a lot of times I see people for. Uh, different reasons have different properties and different LLCs and, and different companies and LLCs. Okay. But when the point comes where they have to start shutting them down or they sell the property or, or they dissolve, uh, now there's, a, there's some risks involved in that if they don't do it properly. Well, uh, in multiple member LLCs particularly, uh, if uh, one member wants to leave, and if, and if it's an at will, so you can schedule your, you create your LLC for either um, you know, a term of years or at will. Um, and if it's an at will LLC and somebody wants to disassociate, uh, it's possible that they could completely take down the LLC if they, if they wanted to, if they, if they cared to. Uh, but at the very least, they would have to, they need a, a you know, an equalizing distribution. Um, they need to understand that they still carry a fiduciary duty for, I think it's six months, maybe it's 90 days, depending on the situation. Um, and that's 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 for representation purposes. Your fiduciary duty to the corporation, you know, follows those type, you know, mm -hmm. duty of loyalty and, and, and care. Uh, I, some some of the examples I've seen where uh, disassociating members have taken equipment or taken uh, property, you know, sometimes intellectual property. So in theory, somebody could say, well, let, let's form an LLC. I'm going to bring in a bunch of this equipment for the kitchen. I'm going to bring in this bunch of equipment for the dining area, and we're going to try this thing, and it doesn't work, and then they take their stuff and go home. That could be a problem if there's not, if it's not done properly. If they didn't, if they do, didn't do a proper winding down, um, either according to their operating agreement or according to the statute, uh, then they may be liable for uh, personally liable for um, you know monies that they have misspent or di or um, distributions that they have taken that were not in accordance with either the law or the uh, statute um, and also um, you know if they start up their own say for instance a kitchen like you said or, or a, you know a kid, uh, if they start up their own business now they are you know now they're competing in violation mm -hmm. of fiduciary duty and possibly in violation of uh, um, uh, deceptive trade practices, HRS 480, it's possible there that that turns into a, you know, a, a whole different thing. I hope everybody's catching these uh, Hawaii Revised Statute uh, 480, yeah. 428. Yeah, sorry, there's a that. lot. Yeah. Of that. <laughs> But, I mean, that's what you're here for. Right, right, People right. don't have to remember that. They just reach out to you, and you've got all that right. up here. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry to use it. Yeah, <laughs> kind of. No, but, but I would imagine that, you know, and you mentioned it's uh, comparable to a divorce proceeding, I guess. But, you know, when partners get together, um, you know, and form an LLC, and they do something, there could be two or three of them, four of them. Um, and then one decides to leave or two or, you know, I, it can get pretty complicated. And if they don't have that operating agreement, it defaults back to the 428. Defaults back to 428. Um, and as long as everybody is uh, amicable, 
in their in their separation. We know that, that always happens, right? Right, and yeah. It, right, right. Yeah. So that's what happens. Yeah, if they're not amicable, if it's a, if there's a problem, then uh, and they don't have an operating agreement, then they're everybody's probably. You know, needs it's a funny. Everybody's amicable until they don't get what they want, right. and right. they don't become right. so friendly. Right. Yeah, I think the reason somebody called it the divorce court of uh, business law is because business law typically is about money, but in, when it comes to breaking apart your partnership, sometimes it gets a, sometimes it becomes about principle. Right. That gets in the way sometimes. Um, the other the other scenario that could be complicated is that if you've got a very successful business and there could be two or three uh, members, and then all of a sudden one of them passes away, and then maybe the the, the child or the spouse wants it or doesn't want it, um, there better be some provisions in the operating agreement and how to handle that, right? Uh, for the family, uh, right, the family, there's, as far as estate planning with an LLC, that's there's some very particular things um, that I'm not, com I, I know enough to know that I don't know enough But you to, know right. enough to find out. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I think that with the, when they become much more successful and then uh, what happens often is uh, one member will find a client or several clients who want that member to disassociate from the mm. bit from the LLC and just only represent those clients on whatever it is that is r most likely that's going to be a violation of your okay. fiduciary you be duty careful now we're we're in the final few seconds yeah. of the show and we're gonna have to wrap up here pretty quick any real short final words uh, you want to leave with the audience or the viewers today? I mean, I would just say that uh, if there was anything, it would, um, you know, know the statute, know the law, and... Uh, and if you don't, that's what you're here for. Right, right. <laughs> Very good. Well, there, there is risk involved, but um, this is Reg Baker, Business in Hawaii. We've had a, a very interesting and, and somewhat scary conversation mm -hmm. with Jeff today, Jeff Willard, who's a, an attorney, and uh, we were talking about LLCs and some of the risks involved. Um, but if you have any, any questions, uh, Jeff uh, has got a website. Uh, what is that website? It's uh, jeffersonwillard.com. All right, mm -hmm. just uh, reach out and Jeff can help you with your issues. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, we'll see you next Thursday at two o'clock. Aloha. <laughs>